Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Season's greeting, folks. This here's Big Ho Ho Hosmadraw, wishing you some holiday cheer. Also, I'm dressed like this as part of my community service. A lot of folks are doing their holiday shopping online these days. That means now more than ever, you gotta keep your personal information safe. That's why the Ho Ho Hoss always puts a little bit of Surfshark VPN in the stockings of all the good little boys and girls. Surfshark hides your IP address and protects you when you're on public Wi-Fi. You can connect to one of thousands of global servers to access sites and streaming libraries you normally couldn't get. It also offers safe and speedy torrenting, even keeps you safe from doxing. Now the internet's a veritable gumdrop village of naughty boys and girls, folks. Hey, I should know best. Where do you think I got on my pill- oh, Sorry. My P.O.'s watching this, kayfabe brother. Anyway, Surfshark will help you to a winter web wonderland. Right now you can get it for 84% off with an extra four months for free by going to the link below and using the code REGRET at checkout. It's a Christmas miracle, thanks to Surfshark. Now if you'll excuse me, I gotta go outside and score some pin, uh, I mean, I'm gonna go uh, feed my reindeer. That's right, I'm gonna go feed my reindeer some uh, reindeer pellet gimmick. Yes, that's what I was gonna do. Excuse me, bye-bye. Happy Holidays, Big Ho Ho Hoss McGraw, signing off! Well folks, we're continuing our journey to the end of WCW pay-per-view by pay-per-view in the year 2001. Sin is in our rear view mirror and as Fusion Media works to finalize the purchase of WCW from AOL Time Warner, hope that works out for them, it's time for WCW Super Brawl Revenge from February 18th at the Nashville Municipal Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. Mike Ryan from Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret nominated this show and by being the only one to do it, therefore just justifies the existence of this entire trilogy. So thanks, Mike. Just under 4,400 people in the auditorium, 70,000 pay-per-view buys for this show. It's down 10K from Sin the previous month, but it's unchanged from the number of buys from last year's Super Brawl. Tony Schiavone and Scott Hudson are on commentary here. And since the beginning of the year, the landscape in WCW has already drastically changed. The big story right now is the rise of the Magnificent Seven, or Mag Seven, as I'll call them occasionally, led by CEO Rick Flair, you got the world champion Scott Steiner, Jeff Jarrett, totally buff and road warrior animal. They formed an alliance after sin as the result of a grand conspiracy by Flair to rid WCW of Goldberg and consolidate Flair's power. They're going against a babyface contingent of Kevin Nash, DDP, Commissioner Cat, Chronic, and at first Rick Steiner, but a couple weeks after fighting the baddies and winning the US title in the process, he swerves Nash and joins his younger brother Scott to round out the Magnificent Seven. It's the same basic principle principle as, you know, the New World Order in their prime or the corporation, the World Wrestling Federation, just a big super group of heels running roughshod in the baby faces, doing what they want, and they're emboldened because, you know, a man of power is in charge here. And the whole, the, every week from Sin to Super Brawls, it's been a constant game of one-upsmanship between the faces and the heels where every time Nash seems to have a leg up, whether it's holding Flair or Flair's son David hostage, or every time it looks like there's tension among the heels, there's a big old swerve that allows the baddies to stay on top. Like I said, we get a lot of these happening in the weeks between Sin and Super Brawl, and it gets really annoying. Honestly, if they were able to somehow cut two weeks of time from between pay-per-views, I think it would have been a stronger, tighter build because things got really repetitive by the end. Your opening match is a six-man, four-corners cruiserweight contender match. Evan Courageous, Jamie Noble, Kaz Hayashi, Yang, Shannon Moore, and Shane Helms are in this thing here. Helms is filling in for Billy Kidman, who got beat down by Animal backstage during an interview on the pre-show. Helms did lose a qualifying match to Kaz a few weeks ago, but does come back to fill in for Kidman. One thing you can say about WCW around this time is their consistency in how they open up shows. Whether it be Nitro, Thunder, or pay-per-views, they almost always begin with a big cruiserweight match. That's the time-tested formula to start with a bang, have the big exciting matches with the big flying flips and stuff to really wake the crowd up. And this show is no different. Uh, one thing you can say, it's definitely, it, it works to an extent because all the stuff you see, this current crop of cruiserweights, definitely ahead of their time in terms of what they're doing in the ring. I brought this up a little bit before in the Sin Review. Uh, you know, it's definitely the stuff we see that is the norm today in like AEW and WWE. But this was very brand new stuff relative 
relatively, happening just about uh, 19, 20 years ago. This match is every man for himself with elimination rules to see who's the number one contender for Chavo Guerrero's Cruiserweight title. We get some teamwork from the three count members, then some more flying by the Young Dragons. Great sequence between Noble and Hayashi, followed up with some between Noble and Yang. There's some miscommunication between Courageous and Yang and what might have been a backdrop spot, and it gets kind of worse from there. Courageous and Yang are just falling apart in there. Some more botches until it looks like Evan hurts himself on an overshoot. Lays dead in the corner for a good while after Shane tags in for him. Big ass DDT by Yang onto Shannon. He finally tags in Kaz is on a big run. We get a sequence where everyone misses their flying moves. Then right after everyone hits their flying moves, including a big ass flipping sent onto the outside by Noble. Noble and Courageous fight over the pinfall because they forget it's an elimination match for some reason. A tombstone by Jamie takes out Yang. Shannon hits the bottoms up from the top rope onto Jamie to eliminate him. Double teaming by three count. We get a backslide into a leg drop combo, but shouldn't the backslide by itself have been a pin? Look at that knee to the back of his head. That was really rough. Why is Kaz so out of position here? Shannon got none of that kick, but still has to sell anyway, kinda. Armstrong is out in his feet as they try to keep this match going. Nightmare on Helm Street on Shannon, and we're down to Shane and Kaz Hayashi. A big top rope sunset flip by Shane's counter with a big old kick and an awkward looking pin, and there's a kick out. Shane ultimately outlasts Hayashi, hits the vertebraker to win. I gotta give this one two and a half stars. It's pretty low for me because I love the cruiserweights in WCW, but I mean, this match was just hard to get through because they missed a lot of big things in here. At times, it felt really rushed and they were just trying to get to the next spot and it really cost them as a result. There were still some cool moves and sequences that you know were fun and exciting and woke the crowd up, but I'm sorry, if you mess up so bad you end up fucking up the referee with a knee to the back of the head and he's an innocent bystander and all this, it's not a great match. We get some hidden camera footage from earlier that shows Chavo Guerrero Jr you're approaching Ric Flair and Animal backstage. Animal walks off, starting to see some possible connection between that and Kidman's assault during the pre-show. Backstage with Hugh Morris. That's right, Hugh Morris. No longer General Hugh G. Erection, because ever since Sin, the misfits in action have been officially disbanded. What happened a week or two after Sin, Chavo's convinced Sergeant Wall to turn on General Erection and become his bodyguard of sorts. Morris tells Corporal Cajun to turn in his shirt. Everyone goes back to their old names now. They're pre-MIA days. Rey Mysterio Jr. actually becomes an ally of Hughes for a bit in this build because he's feuding with Chavo, including some great work between Rey and The Wall. I actually really enjoyed their chemistry a lot in the matchups that, that Rey and Wall had in the build to this thing. If you have the time, go check out their matches. I think Rey, I forget the date now, but Rey Mysterio Jr. versus The Wall on Nitro is kind of a hidden gem. Anyway, back to the promo, Hugh gives his thoughts on the wall, saying that it was General Rection who saved a wall, showed him mercy when he was looking for direction, and Rection may have had mercy for the wall, but Hugh Morris only has hate in his heart for him. Chronic, 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 enter the arena when Commissioner Lance Storm cuts them off. I'll explain how we got there late, but Storm tells him to get cleared by a company doctor to make it official. Something seems fishy here. Time now for the grudge match, cause that's the wall, brother, as he takes on Hugh Morris, former MIA brothers in arms doing battle here. Fighting on the outside, Morris slams the steel steps into his opponent, follows up with a big flying elbow drop in the ring. Wall cuts Hugh off with a boot and works him over. He goes for a hangman sleeper in the corner, but Morris fights out of it, maybe? Goes for a big leg drop and misses. Morris takes Wall to Dick Kick City, goes to pick him up and they awkwardly fall into the ropes. They try it again and another flapjack leaves both men down again. We get a back body drop and some more time to rest. Someone in the crowd yells, you can do it! And I feel really old there. Morris the German and the no laughing matter moonsault to win the match, but he's not done. Hits the moonsault again after the bell rings. This one gets one and a half stars out of five for me. I appreciate the storyline and the betrayal of Wall, like Morris's, you know, fight for revenge and everything. And, you know, I think the heat going into this angle and this match was, was well done. But this match itself, I thought was a bit too slow paced for my taste. Also a couple of really big slides sloppy points in the matchup, like I mentioned. And like, we see that a lot in the first half of this show where just like the, the matches are cursed and just there's big botches of plenty uh, in most cases. Backstage, Conan approaches Animal outside Flair's office. K-Dog is soon escorted out of the building. The natural born thrillers implode over the WCW Tag Team Championships as Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare defend against Sean Stasiak and Mark Jindrak. Team Ack. Yes, the natural born thrillers were pretty much the stable of the year in WCW in 2000. Just a bunch of young, hungry guys from the power plant looking to make a name for themselves in the business, led by above average Mike Sanders, and they were all freaking over programming as a result. But as soon as the Magnificent Seven forms, NBT is essentially done with. There's only room for one 
one heel supergroup, guys. Sorry. Without much warning, suddenly there's jealousy between two camps in the faction while Sanders becomes Flair's pet project slash lackey. Reno just vanishes for some reason, and we're down to these two pairs of former teammates going at it. Before the match, Stasiak says he and Jindrak were the real leaders of the Natural Born Thrillers. He's really trying to put over the phrase, note to self, in his promos. Sean O'Hare comes out and tells him to shut up, and the match begins. Just four big athletic dudes doing big athletic things in the ring, but the champs had the upper hand early on. Palumbo gets double teamed by Team Ack repeatedly. Chuck gets worked over forever by the challengers. Finally, Stasiak goes to the top rope splash, but Palumbo rolls out of the way. O'Hare finally tags in and is a house of fire against his former teammates. He goes to the Sean Tom, but Stasiak pulls Jindrak out of the way. I give this one three stars out of five. It's a solid tag team match and probably the cleanest one so far of the night in terms of execution and not screwing moves up. Uh, you know, I think it's kind of disappointing that for all of the effort that was put into building the Natural Born Thrillers in the year 2000 and the first part of 2001, for the group to end at this point the way it has, not with a bang, but with this serious whimper as it's been kind of fragmented, Mike Sanders doing his own thing, that's a bit disappointing, I would imagine, for the people involved in that group. They didn't have a more appropriate feeling blow-off. Well, before Cody Rhodes wrestled, it was Dustin who was the American Nightmare. He's cutting a promo on Ric Flair here. Says Flair did everything in his power to keep him out of WCW, but now he's going to draw first blood against Magsev when he beats Rick Steiner for the U.S. title. But before that, back to Cruiserweight action as Chavo Guerrero Jr. defends the Cruiserweight title against Rey Mysterio Jr. Rey earned the title shot by winning a gauntlet match a few weeks ago against nine other Cruiserweights. Then two weeks later, he pulled an El Caliente by wrestling under a mask as El Nino and pinning Chavo in a non-title match. The action starts out fast here, Rey launching Chavo out of the ring and later blocks a sunset flip off the apron and hits a Hurricane Rana on the outside. Chavo gets hucked off the top rope, but he's able to recover, knocks Rey off the top and puts him in the Tree of Woe, but Ray counters back. Chavo gets Ray in the Gory Special. Ray fights out of it for a minute, but gets right back in and eats a Gory Bomb. Even without a mask, Ray can't stop messing with his gear. Mysterio fights back with the Snake Eyes into a tilt world backbreaker, but Chavo intercepts him with a drop kick. Chavo grabs a fan's mask and puts it on Ray as the beating continues. Oh, the symbolism! Ray comes back and the pace quickens. Chavo grabs the championship belt, but Ray with a huge sent on to the outside. Back in the ring, Ray looks to go for a lion salt, but totally eats it on the rope. Chavo brings in a chair, sets it up in the corner. On the apron, some fighting leads to Ray hitting a quick hurricane rana off the apron and onto the floor. Look at Chavo bounce there. Bronco buster by Ray, goes to the chair, but the ref fights him for it. Chavo with a different chair and he dinks Ray with it when the ref's distracted. The brain buster, Chavo wins and retains. Man, there's gotta be something in the water in Nashville on this night or something going on with the ring that's causing every match so far in the night to be a mighty struggle with a lot of botches peppered in. But son of a bitch, this is the best match of the night. I give it four stars out of five. I could never get tired of watching Ray and Chavo do battle, whether it's in WCW or in WWE. These guys just bring it every time I see them. And this one's no exception. Some great back and forth here and just some great cruiserweight action. Time for the US Championship match as Magsev's Rick Steiner defense against Dustin. Dustin Rhodes. Dustin, who was kayfabe fired at Spring Stampede 2000, has returned to WCW. Originally brought in by Flair under the assumption he would join the supergroup, Dustin immediately turns Flair away. That's two times in a row now Dustin comes back to WCW under one pretense, only to swerve somebody once he gets there. Put everybody in here to take a good long look at this crap I'm in. Dustin beat Steiner one week ago on Nitro to officially be reinstated in WCW, earning a rematch of the title in the process. Dustin starts out strong, but he really needs to learn not to go for the cross body so early. Steiner grinding his fingers into Dustin's face in the corner. When Dustin gets on offense, he still looks so smooth and so effortless here. Might not be the best point in his life personally, but he can still go in the ring. Dustin fights out of the submission and tries to come back, but he's snuffed out again with a Steiner line. But a minute later, Dustin throwing a lariat of his own and both men are down. Dustin Dustin with a big run, fighting to the outside as the referee reprimands him for grabbing a chair. Rick exposes a turnbuckle in the corner. Some corner punches by Dustin, but Steiner drops him face first into the bolt. Steiner with a pin and the win. Rick picks him up and drops him again after the bell and says his catchphrase, which is still over despite him being a heel. Dustin recovers and strikes back, hits the shattered dreams in the corner. Mega dick kick city. So both guys end up looking good and bad. I give it three stars out of five. You know, along with the tag title match earlier, it's probably one of the only matches in the first half of the show that doesn't have some noticeable ugly botch in the ring. It's just a well-executed match with a clever finish, but the stuff they do after the match, after the bell, kind of takes, takes away from it, in my opinion.
Backstage, the CEO sits down with the commish, and he says he wants Dustin Rhodes out of the building along with anyone else who loses against his team tonight. Also tells Storm to announce the winner of the Chronic Totally Buff match will earn a tag title shot at Greed. Elsewhere, DDP's chatting with the cat, pumps him up as he gets ready for his match with Storm. Those punches are all wrong, cat. You gotta move with dynamic resistance. In your next match, Totally Buff, or buffed, depending on who's talking, takes on Chronic. Now, Chronic have been part of the anti-Magnificent Seven contingent all month, but they hit a rough patch recently. Brian Clark was taken out with an injury, and then the baddies announced a no substitution rule, basically saying that if Adams, or I'm sorry, if Clark's not clear to compete, then Adams can't find a replacement partner, it'd be a hand handicap match essentially. Luger on the mic saying how great he and Buff are, puts over the group and we get some Goldberg chants and both he and Buff shout that Goldberg is fired, 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 fired. I actually enjoy the on-air chemistry of Lex and Buff as a tag team. Not so much as wrestlers, but like their personalities and when they're on the mic, I'm very entertained by what they do. And they kind of give off this don't give a fuck attitude, which I kind of admire in certain cases. And you know, I don't think that me smiling and laughing when I see them is the desired reaction for this group of heels, but that's the impression I get from them. The one thing about them joining the Magnificent Seven is, is that when they joined, they became like, you know, they were relegated to being like, like stooges or kind of like grunts. They're kind of the first wave bosses uh, in the Magnificent Seven. They're like the first line of defense. This is a very tertiary, you know, storyline. Adams shows up and sure enough, Clark's still being held behind by who Hudson calls the WCW quack doctor. Not a good message to send, Scott. But the last second we see Clark does appear on the stage. They brawl in darkness and Buff destroys Clark with a chair. So it's a handicap match after all. Adam begins strong with a double DDT, but totally Buff get the advantage Soon after, Luger with some big hip drops on the back, but it gets countered with a knee to the groin, classic. Follows up with a power slam of sorts on the total package. Adams throws Buff into Luger, goes to the full Nelson slam, but suddenly Clark in the ring decks his own partner from behind, hits a suplex, or does he? The real Brian Clark shows up on stage looking beaten down, and the guy we thought was Clark is actually Mike Awesome in disguise. Okay, I dig the commitment to the look with the tan of the facial hair and all that. Buff with the blockbuster, Adam takes it like shit, Totally buff wins. I give it one star out of five. You know, I've talked before about when you see like Lex Luger and Buff Bagwell in a match together, there's two big immobile guys and it doesn't work. So, hey, let's add a third big immobile guy to the mix and see what happens here. I will say, I admire the level of smoke and mirrors that was needed to give off the impression that it was actually Brian Clark who got laid out at the beginning of the matchup. Like the lights were out, you see a silhouette and like it's the, they're fighting in the dark, you hear the chair shot and then you don't see him for the rest of the match. And then you see the reveal, I'm like, man, that was actually really well done. I did not expect that happening there. So kudos to WCW for a proper swerve that actually felt kind of earned. Lance Storm has security usher Chronic out after the match, but Adams and Clark fight on their way out. In our next match for the commissionership in WCW, Lance Storm defends his position against the Cat. So how on earth did we get here? Because at Sin, in the last review, the Cat regained the commissionership by beating Mike Sanders. You think they'd be the end of it, but it's not, because after Ric Flair turns heel and forms a Magnificent Seven, he forces the Cat to basically defend his job of commissioner on every show, almost on a weekly basis, sometimes twice a week against a random assortment of people until finally after some crooked officiating by Mike Sanders, Lance Storm beats Miller the week prior to this on Nitro. So he's only commissioner for less than a week as he's putting that job on the line. The job just felt like it was being treated like a championship and not even a prestigious championship either. It was literally just being defended against like anybody with a pulse week after week. And it just felt like it was diminishing like the significance of that position. As kayfabe as it is, it's still like the be the authority figure you should have some kind of like protection against that and it just was not there. Also, after watching tons of WCW programming lately, I can safely say that Ms. Jones is the most useless character in all of WCW. She has zero dialogue. She contributes nothing to the matches for the most part. She's just literally there to stand there and look pretty next to the cat, who, by the way, I like the cat's character, but I think as, you know, the, the, the package of cat and Ms. Jones, Ms. Jones is completely useless to him and adds nothing to the show. So one week into his job, Lance Storm declares himself the greatest commissioner in WCW history. 
history. Brother, until I watched these shows to prepare for this review, I didn't even know you were commissioner. The cat interrupts and calls Storm a fake Power Ranger, which, okay, that's a new one. Says Lance sucks as a commissioner, tells the fans to call his mama, and the match begins. Storm begins with some quick technical moves, but Cat strikes back with a flurry of kicks. After fighting on the outside, Storm attacks Miller's knee and wraps it around the rope, works the leg aggressively here. Storm goes up top, but the cat beals him off. Storm goes back to the leg, wraps it around the ring post. Lance going for a sunset flip, but much in the same way you should never try and powerbomb Billy Kidman, you should never try to hit a sunset that flip on Ernest Miller. Big comeback. Cat goes to the feliner, but Storm catches him, puts him in the maple leaf. We get a rope break. Out comes Mike Sanders, who's promptly slapped and kicked in the head by Ms. Jones. Well, even a broken clock works twice a day. Cat hits the feliner on Storm to win and regain the role of commissioner. Well, fun while it lasted, Storm. I enjoyed Lance's work in this match, and I think that Ernest's uh, selling of the leg was also pretty well done, telling a good story there. Uh, you know, it's funny. I don't think Mike Sanders needed to be there, but he was there to necessarily necessitate Ms. Jones getting involved. So again, shut my mouth about what I said about Ms. Jones for a little bit, but I stand by what I said because 99% of the rest of the time, she is just, she might as well be invisible. The very next evening. That uh, no one go, no! Good night! This is about the worst thing any athlete can ever see. Up next, the Magnificent Seven's Jeff Jarrett takes on Diamond Dallas Page. And what a wild trip we've gone on to get to this point. Because a few weeks after they made the match, DDP's at a book signing for his autobiography when a fan in line takes a dive near him. Hi, baby AJ Styles, by the way. Later that night, Jarrett's got Page arrested because the fan lied about being assaulted by DDP. Then on Thunder, a couple of days later, Page is able to leave his cell and he leaves a note for for the baddies and a cop traps Flair, Steiner, and Jarrett in the cell to close out the show. Two weeks before the pay-per-view, you got former best friend Canyon coming back to WCW. We've not seen him since around New Blood Rising in the Judy Bagwell in a forklift match, and he jumps DDP in the crowd. Jarrett shows up for his match here and says Paige is unfinished business, then pulls up a video that someone in production must have been very proud of, DDP as Max Headroom. Yo! 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 So now Jared announces that DDP is facing Canyon instead of him. Canyon jumps out from under the ring and hits Paige from behind to start the match. Paige jumped to the outside after a low blow and they brawl out there for a bit. Canyon with a very creative version of the rocker dropper on the top of the steps and Paige is bleeding. Canyon brings him in with a suplex on the ropes. Nice. Canyon spends several minutes beating on DDP, but Paige is resilient, takes Canyon down with a lariat. Paige with a high angle uranagi and a sit out power bomb but Canyon's able to kick out of both. Canyon blocks the diamond cutter attempt, takes Paige to Dick Kick City and hits the Canyon Cutter. Kick out by Paige, out comes Jeff Jarrett again for some more chicanery. DDP accidentally flattens the referee after a kick out. Jarrett hits the stroke on Paige, Canyon with the flatliner, Canyon wins. I'm going to give this one three stars out of five, despite, again, more screwy finishing to end this matchup, as is the theme of the night, it seems. I thought that the innovation we saw from Kane in this match was good. I liked a lot of what we saw here, and I think the added bonus of them having that history before as part of the Jersey triad and them being friends and everything. Hadn't seen them since uh, DDP left and Canyon became positively Canyon, so nice to see him back here in this match. But then right afterward, Canyon grabs the mic and starts doing some ring announcing, announcing a match with a two-hour time. Limit. Can you imagine between Paige and Jeff Jarrett? So now the match is official. They're brawling out on the floor by the crowd, back at ringside. Paige drops Jarrett with a DDT on the announce table. DDP is shoved off the table into Tony Schiavone's lap as Jarrett grabs a chair. Oh God, please don't kill Schiavone. Jarrett with multiple strikes the Tum Tum with a chair. We go back to the ring. Jarrett locks in the sleeper, but Paige fights back. Hits a swing in DDT, which leads to a double down. Paige comes back and hits a big face buster. Canyon comes back and drags. Tags Paige out of the ring. Jarrett hits DDP with the chair when the ref's not looking, but somehow Paige kicks out. Jarrett goes to El Cabong, but DDP ducks, and Canyon gets decked instead. Diamond Cutter, shoulders back, chest out. DDP wins. I also give this one three stars out of five. I think that the added drama of Paige having wrestled the previous match helped add to the story of this one, even though I think him wrestling two matches back-to-back -back was already kind of unnecessary. Like, there's already enough odds stacked against the baby faces in these matches. Do we really need to pile more of them on is what I thought until I saw the main event. <laughs> Thank you.
your main event, Scott Steiner defends the world championship against Kevin Nash. And boy, oh boy, let me tell you what old Scotty's been up to since the events that took place at Sin. So, as we all know, Sid Vicious broke his leg in a horrific freak accident in that main event at Sin one month ago. But in storyline, Scott is taking credit for the injury, even though he had nothing to do with it, and now is just breaking people's legs for the heck of it. He broke Christopher Daniels and Michael Modest's legs on Nitro. He attacked Kevin Nash's leg. He's been beating up security. And here's a fun fact for you. At the very end of the Go Home Thunder, he whacked security guy in the leg, and the last thing you see before you fade to black is a side of the man's leg visibly broken in multiple places. Now, it was a prosthetic leg, and you can see the guy like bracing himself for impact and just ex having the leg out there get ready to be hit. So that's part of the show. But why is that part of the show? I watched that and my jaw dropped. That's the final visual you get before this big pay-per-view is psychopath Scott Steiner just breaking fool's legs. Now, Owen Hart got heat for the Owen 316 says I just broke your neck t-shirt, but he wasn't going around breaking people's necks for the fun of it after the events of SummerSlam 97. Who thought it was a good idea, A, to have Steiner be this massive like serial leg breaker kind of gimmick, and then also to just completely go over the top with that visual at the end, this dude is wincing in pain as his leg is mangled and looking like this horrific thing. Like, why would you show that on television at all? So Kevin Nash became the number one contender after he powerbombed Alex Wright into oblivion, but weeks later, Flair took the title shot away after accusing Nash of drinking on the job. In reality, he and DDP were not unconscious after a beatdown by Magsev. Nash regained the title shot and actually wrestled Steiner for the title like twice on Nitro in the weeks leading up to this, and there was always screwy shit happening. Long, strange road to get here. Ric Flair shows up first to join the folks on commentary, but he won't say what's in the envelope he showed earlier. Michael Buffer's in relaxed mode with his crew neck shirt under the blazer instead of the white tuxedo. Steiner on the mic brings up Sid's injury again, this time with the footage. Why? Stop showing us that. Look, if the network did cut out the leg break from Sin, which many people told me on, on the comment section of the review, that's what happened. I personally thought it must have been a very seamless edit because I couldn't tell. But if that's what they did for that, then why don't they also remove the leg break on the Nitro after Sin and then in this stuff you got in the right before the main event of Super Bowl Revenge? Like, it's there. If you look hard enough in the network, you'll find Sid breaking his leg even if they tried their best to cover up the live version of it on Sin. That is a lack of quality control on the part of the network folk. So Nash has not been seen since his leg injury the week before. Questionable for this match. So Flair enters the ring to explain what happens if Nash does not show up. Flair announces the match is now a loser leaves WCW match. The refs made to start the match and the 10 count, but Kevin Nash's music plays. We see him roll up in a wheelchair with his foot in a cast and some nurses are behind him. Scott Steiner offers no simpy to Nash and tells the ref to start counting again. Suddenly Nash with the reveal of the century. It's a gimmick leg, says Shivani. Nash decks Steiner with the belt and as the bell rings, covers him and wins in seconds. Nash seems to win the title and Steiner is gone from the company as Ric Flair freaks out at ringside. <laughs> Flair announces the match is now two out of three falls with no DQ. It's Calvin Ball, everyone. The match restarts and we see DDP make his way to the ring to help, but he gets jumped by Totally Buff and they totally stuff him in the crate. I don't know how he missed them. He was walking right toward them. Nash on the offensive. Medeja gets involved. That allows Steiner to hit Nash with a lead pipe. Flair adds the match is now falls count anywhere, so Steiner pins him on the floor, ties it up. Steiner beats Nash with brass knuckles to really pile it on. Both men are bleeding at this point. Nash with some punches, though, and a big sidewalk slam. Medeja grabs the brass knucks before Nash can get them. Flair hands Steiner a chair, dinks Nash with it, and Shivani goes, he's dead! Steiner recliner locked in, but Nash fights out. Nash with a choke slam. Medeja gets in the ring and grabs the referee, and while that's going on, Nash puts down the straps. The jackknife. Medeja attacks the ref again. Why do they keep getting her involved in these matches when the run-ins never, ever, 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 ever look good? Did I say never? Because I meant to say never. So then Nash hits Medeja with a sidewalk slam. Flair yoinks Charles Robinson out of the ring and decks him. Scott with a low blow. Steiner with another chair shot, another recliner. The new referee calls it and Steiner wins. Kevin Nash has gone from WCW and Shivani with the call of the night. Oh, this sucks.
I give it a half star out of five. Now, when the match is not bogged down by a bunch of silly bullshit and they're actually allowed to work and do things in the ring, it's not that bad. But the match is bogged down by a lot of silly bullshit and that makes the whole match suffer as a result. I mean, I feel the same way after this that I saw about the Nash Steiner Goldberg match the previous year, just like it, all, it, it right on down to the constant Madeja run ins and just points of confusion where, like, what's going to happen here? Why does everything look so bad? Why does it have to look this bad? This is, you know, WCW. Kevin Nash can work, Scott Steiner can work, why can't they work well together? Like We just keep seeing that happen here, and it's just so depressing and tiring to watch after all that madness we saw, everything leading up to this, for it to end that way after the match that we, everything just, oh god, it, 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 what can I say? It sucked. My grade for WCW Super Brawl Revenge is a C plus. This feels very similar on a quality level to Sin in a lot of ways. You know, there is some good on this show. The cruiserweights are generally enjoyable, even though they all miss a lot of stuff in their in their matches tonight. DDP's story arc is fairly well done, but there's a general feeling of just being bogged down by screwy finish after screwy finish, which really has become the norm here in WCW, but it is so tiring. It's just darkest time line, Empire Strikes Back over and over and over again, and there's no reprieve. Anything that goes the way of the baby faces, not just in this show, but the entire build of this show, it feels like it's all for nothing because the heels just come out on top again. You know, don't get me wrong, the WWF was guilty of a lot of the screwy shit that you see in WCW as well, but I feel that it was just more spaced out. I'm not saying it was like done better, I just think the timing of it was done in such a way that it wasn't this constant depressive slog to get through. It's kind of like what we saw with the authority and Baron Corbin in charge WWE a couple of years ago, how we all hated that. That's kind of what I'm feeling right now with WCW and Magnificent Seven, but it's even worse for them because it's all just so concentrated and it's week after week of bullshit finishes and it all culminates here in this show where like the top good guy leaves. You're down Goldberg, you're down Nash. How in the hell are they going to keep this, this story afloat with like those two big names gone, you know, as we head up to our last pay-per-view? If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic pay-per-views for me to review in the future. Next time, though, we are going to look at the final chapter in the end of WCW's pay-per-view run, the final pay-per-view in World Championship Wrestling's history, WCW Greed. How will the good guys battle the Magnificent Seven? What's going to go on with the mid-card? Will Norman Smiley finally get helped up by Glacier once in a while? Time will tell, but until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.